Welcome to the Ted Mann Theater at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. My name is KJ Ralph Miller. I'm the Interim Director of Film Programs here at the museum, and it's so great to see you all here on a Friday night for the opening night of our limited series, Lourdes Portillo, Una Vida de Directora. This screening series is running through May 21st here in this theater, and in speaking with some colleagues earlier this evening, we actually came to the realization that the screening series is the first screening series at the Academy Museum dedicated to a Chicana filmmaker. So this is a real milestone moment. Um, tonight we're going to be screening two films. We won't be taking a break between the two films and we'll be showing After the Earthquake from 1979, which is a short film, runtime is about 23 minutes. Um, and we're showing a brand new restoration of that digitally. And then we will follow that with Las Madres, The Mothers of Plaza de Mayo from 1985. And I should note, yes, thank you. I should note that while both of these films are directed by Lourdes Portillo, the woman of the hour, um, we are also, I should also note that After the Earthquake was co-written and directed by Nina Serrano, and uh, Las Madres was co-directed by Susana Munoz. And so we really want to acknowledge their contributions here, and I'm sure Lourdes will be speaking about uh, both of those collaborations when she joins us here after the screening for a conversation. For over four decades, the Mexican-born and Los Angeles-raised writer-director-producer Lourdes Portillo has crafted nuanced film and video works that center the emotions and circumstances of diverse Latinx experiences. One of the few Chicana filmmakers of the 1970s who's still working today, Portillo has evolved her craft and expanded her interests to reinvent the form and ethos of activist filmmaking. And I would like to also note that the second film tonight, we are running on 16 millimeter, and that has been built up onto a big reel, so the entire film is on a single reel. Thanks, of course, to our projectionist Spencer tonight, who's up there in the booth. We could not do these shows without you and your skilled hands and eyes, so thank you so much, Spencer. And so, uh, on that note, um, I just wanted to turn it over to introduce our guest, uh, our speaker tonight, and I don't have the rest of my notes here somehow, but I do have his bio, so bear with me. Uh, J. Raul Guzman is an assistant curator at the Academy Museum and a dear colleague. He has worked on Regeneration, Black Cinema, 1898 to 1971, which is currently on view on our fourth floor through July 16th. He's also worked on the Hayao Miyazaki exhibition that opened the doors of this museum and installation Pedro Almodovar, which is currently on view as well, among others. Previously, he served as assistant director of the New York-based Cinema Tropical, and in 2015, he was selected as a Miss Smithsonian Institute Latino Museum Studies Fellow. Guzman received his BA in history from the University of California, Los Angeles, and studied at the National Autonomous University in Mexico. He holds an MA in Latin American and Caribbean studies from New York University, and an MA in museum studies from John Hopkins University. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Raul Guzman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lourdes Portillo is an important filmmaker, journalist, curator, activist, and visual artist born in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1943. Her filmmaking style is a hybrid of cinematic styles. She has used her keen visual eye to illuminate several important issues of our time. In February, the museum opened an exhibition on Lourdes Portillo. If you haven't seen it, I hope you can make uh, a trip to the second floor. Uh, the exhibition was curated by my wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Sofia Serrano, working in close collaboration with Lourdes. Self-Help Graphics collaborated with our team for the creation of the altar. Lourdes has been an integral part of the development of the museum and how we champion the work of uh, Latino uh, filmmakers. She first started working with us for the Getty's Pacific Standard Initiative, um, resulting in the project from Latin America to Hollywood, Latino film culture in Los Angeles, 1967 to 2017, back in 2013, before the museum broke ground. Uh, both Sophie and I started working at the museum for that project, and I am happy to call Lourdes a dear friend and mentor. Uh, thanks to Lourdes's work as a creator, uh, the Academy Oral History Project was able to add interviews with several Latinx filmmakers to our collection, including interviews with Luis Valdez, Patricia Cardoso, Alfonso Cuaron, and others. 
That project resulted in a bilingual publication and donations of several collections to the Academy, and we are so much richer for it. Lourdes has remained committed uh, to, the, to supporting the work of the curatorial team, most recently advising us in an upcoming exhibition on Chicano cinema. Uh, we thank her for her amazing passion and conviction. Lourdes has said, I was drawn to filmmaking because I never saw people like me and stories like me on screen. Her work has focused on centering women's stories using cinema to highlight social injustices. Her work remains inspirational to a generation of filmmakers. Tonight we will see After the Earthquake, uh, a film that explores multi-generational migration and social inequality, and uh, the film that she made years later with Susana Munoz, The Mothers of Plaza de Mayo. The film follows a group of mothers that would meet weekly at the Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires as they demanded justice for the more than 30,000 disappeared during Argentina's uh, military dictatorship. The film earned Lourdes an Academy Award nomination for Best Documentary Film, and she was the first Chicana filmmaker uh, to earn that honor. We are so honored to have Lourdes with us tonight. Please stay for a post-screening discussion with her. Lourdes Portillo, uh, cineasta, periodista, activista y curadora, y artista visual, nació en Chihuahua, México, en 1943. Su estilo cinematográfico es un híbrido de estilos. Ella ha utilizado su agudo sentido visual para iluminar varios temas importantes hoy en día. En febrero, el museo inauguró una exposición sobre Lourdes Portillo. Si no la han visto, espero que tomen un momento para visitar la segunda, el segundo piso del museo. La exposición fue comisariada por mi maravillosa colega, la doctora Sofía Serrano, en colaboración con Lourdes. Self Help Graphics colaboró con nuestro equipo para la creación del altar. Es un honor poder resaltar el trabajo de Lourdes en el museo. Lourdes ha sido una parte integral del desarrollo del museo en cómo incluimos el cine latino. Comenzó a trabajar con nosotros en el 2013 para la iniciativa del Museo del Getty uh, Pacific Standard Time que resultó en el proyecto de América Latina a Hollywood, la cultura cinematográfica latina en Los Ángeles de 1967 al 2017. Tanto Sofía como yo comenzamos a trabajar uh, para el museo durante ese proyecto. Estoy feliz de poder considerar a Lourdes como una amiga y consejera. Gracias al trabajo de Lourdes como curadora, el proyecto de historias orales de la academia pudo agregar entrevistas a nuestra colección con varios cineastas latinos, incluidos Luis Valdés, Patricia Cardoso, Alfonso Cuarón, entre otros. Ese proyecto resultó en una publicación bilingüe y donaciones de varias colecciones a la academia. Lourdes sigue ayudándonos en el museo, más recientemente aconsejándonos sobre una próxima exposición sobre el cine chicano. Le agradecemos su increíble pasión y convicción y por seguir inspirando una nueva generación de cineastas. Lourdes ha dicho, me trajo el cine porque nunca vi personas como yo e historias como la mía en la pantalla. En su trabajo ha centrado las historias de las mujeres utilizando el cine para resaltar las injusticias sociales. Esta noche veremos Después del Terremoto, co-dirigida con la poeta Nina Serrano. La película es una exploración de la migración y la desigualdad so social. Años más tarde trabajó con Susana Muñoz para co-dirigir Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo. La película sigue a un grupo de madres que se reunían semanalmente en la Plaza de Mayo de Buenos Aires mientras exigían justicia para los más de 30,000 desaparecidos durante la dictadura militar argentina. Con la película, Lourdes obtuvo una nominación de la Academia por Mejor Película Documental, la primera cineasta chicana en hacerlo. Estamos muy honrados en tener a Lourdes con nosotros esta noche. Por favor, quédense para una discusión posterior a la proyección con ella y que viva Lourdes. Hi, Lourdes. Hi. <laughs> I'm also very grateful for this invitation to be a part of this uh, opening and this new enterprise that I think is going to be very successful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being here. It's really an honor to have you here. And I know in speaking with Raul backstage, just how integral you were to the opening of this institution, 
when it was just a twinkle in everyone's eye and before it was an actual physical space, you were there advising and advocating in the same way that you advocate through your cinema for representation and for for your voice and the voice of your community to be represented in this space. So I want to thank you in turn for helping to shape this institution into what it is today and what it will continue to grow to be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have your whole bio here. Oh, but no. You're, you're do <laughs> in a little part. you want to indulge me and in, I know Raul and I sort of touched on it a bit in the introduction <laughs> and we'll touch on it for sure in okay. in this conversation tonight okay. um, and I did want to mention that it's when we were planning this series it was really important to you that students were here in the audience and very important and so I really I will take an opportunity after we uh, cover a couple of questions to just open it up to the audience so have your questions in mind because I'll be coming to you later school is in session um, Lourdes I wanted to to start by mentioning that this is this is a milestone birthday year for you um, and and really think about reflecting on the years that you've been on this earth and the first moment that you realized in your years on this earth that you were an artist. Hmm. It, it's a long journey, you know, because you're constructing yourself. You're experiencing everything and you're trying to gather enough knowledge to find out who you might be, you know? And um, it took a, a, a long time of experiences and gathering information. It's like writing a paper, mm -hmm. but you're really not writing it, you're living it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, y I'm just very happy and I just feel like, I remember the first time I went to the cinema when it was in Chihuahua and there was a very old theater and my uncle took us to see Charlie Chaplin. Uh -huh. And um, I had never seen anything like it, a movie. There was no television, remember that. And um, I just was so inspired by seeing these uh, images, you know, projected. And then Charlie Chaplin, I mean, a master. You know, so it, it was an inspiration, and it began like that. And everything that happened thereafter that was very momentous and very visual was put into this category in my head of something. Mm -hmm. Something's talking to me. Mm -hmm. You know, v visual spectacle is talking to me. And... Um, it was, it was gradually that I found out that what I was good at. I was not very good at many things, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really. And, but when I found out that I was good at uh, uh, telling stories visually, you know, it was a great discovery and it was great happiness for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And tell us about your path to get to the San Francisco Art Institute. It's really so moving to enter into the gallery space in our significant movies and movie makers gallery to, and see um, in that space your student ID on display. <laughs> it's so moving and so incredibly important that you held on to that as a memory of your time there, but also as a way for each of us who has been a student to see that and and sort of see ourselves in that too, and see the potential that could come out of that experience. So what was it like getting to the San Francisco Art Institute and what was your, what was your time there like? No, it was, I mean, it was a very long journey. It wasn't until I was married and had children that I went to the Art Institute mm -hmm. because that was a time that I could go to the Art Institute in San Francisco. But, um, I don't know, I don't see it kind of like in that way, you know? I, I saved it because, I don't know, you know, I'm a junk lady. <laughs> I mean, some could say an archivist, but yeah, a, a junk collector too. <laughs> no, I just thought, I thought, 
I, I thought I was victorious. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I was victorious. And I thought I have found myself. Mm -hmm. Not myself, but I, I found my purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very important, find your purpose. And, um, but I was always looking for my purpose. Mm -hmm. So everything, you know, uh, directed me to what is my purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting thing because in India, in, not that I'm Indian or anything, but in India, I remember someone telling me that when they meet you, they say they meet you and they say their name and they ask your name and then they say, and what is your purpose in life? I, I think that's beautiful, uh -huh. you know? So you question yourself, what is your purpose in life? Mm -hmm. You know, and I felt that being an artist was really my purpose. Mm -hmm. I had great teachers, mm -hmm. great teachers that just seemed like nothing at that time. But now in retrospect, they were great teachers. And do you think that the community around you, your fellow students and, and various movements, either political or art making movements or movements of expression that you saw around you, how did that shape who you were? Because I know there was a lot of poetry Yes. that was coming out of the community around you, a lot of activism and, yes. and thoughts about political movements. Yes. Yes, th all that influenced me very much, and I loved it in San Francisco because it was a very small place and also because it was very expressive mm -hmm. and very accepting. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and I got to see great films that I would never get to see anywhere, and, and I heard incredible poetry and I met incredible people mm -hmm. and and I loved living there for that reason because it was so cohesive mm -hmm. you know the artistic community mm -hmm. and in it it enabled me to dream further than I would have mm -hmm. were there particular movements I know that this is when when you made after the earthquake it's sort of um, you know, a moment in time when postmodernism is becoming part of the conversation, right? And and this idea of of self referentiality and um, and also one could say hybrid filmmaking. And I think that that term maybe is one that we're more familiar with now, but maybe wasn't in active use in the '70s and '80s. But I would definitely, in a way, put your films into a hybrid category, and we see that in both of the films that we saw tonight, in a way, um, and also the bridge between them. So I'm curious in what ways um, that that sort of specific movement, because I know postmodernism has influenced you, how do you see that as reflected in the films that we saw tonight, if at all? What I, I think what happened is that there were so many different movements, really, you know, and they were scattered and they were not really cohesive things. They were flying in the air, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I thought that was exactly what I needed. I needed not to feel like I belonged to one movement. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't going to do that. I felt that everything was fair. You know, there was poetry, but one of the most extraordinary things that, were ha that was happening in the San Francisco Mission District where I live, where all the Latinos used to live, um, was the fact that the, their links to Latin America were so strong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because a lot of immigrants from Central America that were fleeing, you know, uh, dictatorships as they were from Argentina, from Brazil. We had all these citizens that were young, that were there were artists, and they felt like they had to protest and do something. Mm -hmm. So. I became a part of that. Mm -hmm. Poetry was very important. You know, music was very important. There was a great, you know, um, artistic movement of every sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, how did that lead to the moment when you started developing the idea for what would become after the earthquake? Um, let's see, after the earthquake, I belonged to a group, um, of people called Third World Communications, mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, we would, you know, people would read, 
poetry, write plays. I mean, to this day, this exists still. You know, um, make posters, mm -hmm. work for the community. And after the earthquake came after the Nicaraguan uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do something to help. And it was Nina Serrano, a poet and a writer and uh, you know, a great person in general. And she and I were two women that was in a group of many men in third world communications and we wanted to do something and we said we want to make a film. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another story. I'm not going to tell that one. Okay. <laughs> 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 that's, that's for X-rated. Oh. <laughs> No, no, I don't mean it that way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, you know how things are. <laughs> no, I, we, we have to hear this story now. <laughs> no, we lived in a community in, in a world that was macho, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and uh, we were just the girls that wanted to make a movie. Wasn't that silly? So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's how it was. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, against many odds, mm -hmm. you know, we made the film. And what we did is we applied, we wrote a screenplay based on the people that lived in the mission. Mm -hmm. And then we applied to the American Film Institute. Mm -hmm. We had never applied for film. And, and we got a grant. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, Whatever they give us, we have to make the film for that money. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. even though you could make a budget, you know, uh, let's just budget what we have. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something to think about when you're making a film, especially when it's a committed film for a reason or a political reason or whatever. You know, you make it with what you have. Mm -hmm. And we did. And, and we um, investigated the whole film, you know, we wrote the whole thing, and we did it for the money that we had, and lo and behold, somehow everything came in, you know, on budget, on that little budget that we had, and, and it was done. And I think it's, it's so interesting that this was a grant from AFI. Uh, right. They had established the directing workshop for women like that was a before. couple of years before. But that AFI was such a champion of female filmmakers like from the get-go as of 50 years ago is pretty remarkable. And so y how did you go about finding your cast and your main characters, the 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 actors mm -hmm. who would play your main characters, mm -hmm. because you see a multi-generational representation of a Nicaraguan family in this film. How did you find folks to, to work with you and to, to perform in this picture? Well, we lived in the community, number one, and we knew a lot of people. And we knew a guy who was a, um, a disc jockey, is that a, what it is, uh, an announcer? In the, a DJ. In the, in the radio, mm -hmm. yeah? Okay, and we asked them, look, give us a hand. We need actors. Just make a call in your radio. Oh, my God. And he said, all right. That's great. And he did it. <laughs> and people came. <laughs> and, you know, Nina had worked in theater before. Mm -hmm. I had worked in, you know, little productions, small productions, which is another story altogether. And... Um, but I felt that Nina had the more kind of narrative. She's a poet as well, mm -hmm. you know, ability to do that. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, she wrote the screenplay with me. We did it together we, and with our uh, cast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and let's cross that bridge between these two films into Las Madres, which I think it's it's so interesting that we have in the first film the memory of torture and the memory of um, of pain and of conflict as relived by one of our lead, lead characters in his mind in his memory, and then the bridge to the next film I think is really the the literalization of that into a real world situation where we have someone describing it 
right? We have a figure who's describing some of these atrocities. And I also just wanted to take a moment to say, I know that this was a hard rewatch for you. Um, so anything that you that is too hard to talk about, I totally understand. No, no. But, okay. but I'm just curious what led you to the story of Las Madres and what uh, process did you go through to decide to make this documentary at, in the follow-up uh, to right. After the Earthquake? Right. And after the earthquake, you know, I had had experiences with the cinematographer uh, or with, for example, Stephen Lighthill, who was the uh, director of the... Um, I think Cinematographers Union here in LA eventually, but uh, you know, he started in San Francisco and he was willing to shoot for nothing. And you know, it, that's how it went. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how it all was. And I'm sorry, but I just lost track of what you just asked me. Oh, I was just asking what uh, led you to find your subjects in oh, Las yeah. Madres right. and then to make the film because I'm, think with most documentaries it's not as quick of a process to make it as a narrative feature right there's That's years of shooting sometimes and then editing and you're also working with archival footage which is my follow-up question but what were the the steps to lead you to okay. your subjects okay well what I was doing I was making the film at the Art Institute and I was in the editing room I was working on a flatbed you guys probably don't know what that is but it's an editing machine, and um, I was playing a tango, and I, I love tango. My mother loved tango, so I was l listening to it, and I was thinking of doing something more edgy because I was going to the Art Institute, of course, mm -hmm. you know. It had to be more edgy. <laughs> and <laughs> but I wanted it to be edgy, too. I'm not innocent. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, and then this woman went by and she said, what, you're playing a tango? You know, in English. And I said, yes. And she said, what are you doing? And, and this was Susanna, mm. Susanna Blaustein. That's her real name because she got married and then it was Munoz. But it's Susanna went by and, and she started telling me about Argentina. And I really didn't know a lot about Argentina. I knew a lot about tango because my mother loved tango. And she started telling me about the mothers of Plaza and Mayo in the editing room. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? I can't even believe what you're telling me. And she told me the whole story and then be we became friends. Mm -hmm. And I became very engaged with thinking about you know, Latin America, mm -hmm. Argentina, what was happening, dictatorships, all that stuff. And I, Mexico has gone through their own drama. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm from. But Argentina just seemed like, they always seemed to me so civilized in a way, you know, but they were less, you know, to me. I thought, wow, what is happening? And I said, Susana, let's make a film. Let's, you know, we were making films, all kinds of films there at the Art Institute. And she said, okay, let's make a documentary. Do you know how to make a documentary? I said, I've never learned how to make a documentary. And I said, and how about you? No, I don't either. Well, let's go find out. <laughs> you know, let's read up on it and ask people what it's like. Mm -hmm. And we investigated it for a while. And then we found out. And I had worked in some documentaries. And they seem a little boring to me, <laughs> you know, because they were, you know, you have to stick to the truth, you have to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to the facts. But then some people cheat a little bit, and it's okay, I guess, but it isn't. <laughs> and uh, so let's say, look, we're, we're going to stick to the truth, and we're going to find everything out, and let's get the story. Let's go and talk to the mothers of Plaza de Mayo. And we did. Mm -hmm. And we called them. We asked them if we could talk to them. They said, yes, but don't come now. Wait. You know, because it was too dangerous at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. And eventually, um, we got enough money 
we had the gall to ask a very rich person for $20,000. I didn't have the gall, Susanna had the gall. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, it, and I said, okay, for $20,000, we can go to Argentina and we can film. And then we have it and, you know, then we'll raise the rest. Mm -hmm. And that's how we did. And how did you come to work with the archival footage that we see in the film? Because you were there on the ground shooting with them, shooting the interviews, shooting them in the plaza. But you also have really skillfully interwoven moments of archival footage that I'm, I would love to hear how you captured it. It does seem that some of it is filmed off of a television. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I believe in, in that. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened, it, it was we tried to, this first, we had to get, you know, all the, the footage, the real, the story down on film. Mm -hmm. And once we had the story, we had to fill it out. Mm -hmm. And then the, we needed a lot of stock footage, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of research. And very little footage was really as damning as the ones that the Dutch did mm -hmm. at the beginning, mm -hmm. when the World Cup was being played, and the Dutch crew went to the Plaza de Mayo and interviewed the mothers. Nobody wanted to interview the mothers. They were like crazy women screaming in a park. But the Dutch did it. Mm -hmm. And that was beautiful because that's the most touching piece of film, mm -hmm. you know, about the mothers. And that's how we started gathering the stock footage. But we also had an incredible um, editor, mm -hmm. Irving Seraf. You know, Irving was wonderful, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, just culling through the amount of re uh, footage you must have gone through to get what ended up on screen. Yeah. Um, it's a really impressive feat, and it must have taken so much time, and that's a full-time job for documentary filmmakers now, like an archival researcher. So it's just so impressive that the two of you were able to bring that together We're in working with your editor to make this story complete. Right. I'm getting uh, the indication that I think it's time to turn to the audience. And I know Lourdes really would love to hear from you. And I'm looking both for feedback, reflections, and also questions. Um, so the first hand I saw up was right here. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. So the question is, what do you think, either then or now, documentary films are missing that can make them, uh, give them more flavor, make them more entertaining and more engaging? You know, I, I'm, I, I, I've seen a lot of good documentaries. There's, there's great documentarians, but I think What's happening is that they've become commercialized, mm -hmm. you know, and then the commercial um, entities demand certain things from them. And I think that it's an artistic endeavor on the part of the filmmaker that that you have to listen to what you want to say. And, and you ha your story has to be a, a compelling story that you tell to someone and they go, oh, Really? You know, I want to see it. Exactly. 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 Yeah, it, what's happened, it's become very commercialized so that, you know, it's all about the money. Mm -hmm. But, w w you know, if you can give yourself the luxury of saying, 
I don't have so much money and I can make a film that's really entertaining, that's really like all, or profound or whatever it is that you wanna say. And then just, you know, it's easy to say, it's easy for me to say now, but really it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And then commit to that because you, you really wanna make a work that is art. You know, you, you, if you wanna make money, it's a different uh, approach, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, right here in the front. Kinda, yeah. The the salad idea turned into a buffet. Do you? Uh, that uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe, you know, it's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll think about that. Um, other questions? Yeah, I see uh, the individual in the hat. Yes. The question is about finding reflections of yourself in communities and in cinematic work that maybe came before you started making films. Well, what I loved about documentary is that they tell you it's got to be true, right? And if you're going to tell the truth, you're going to tell the truth, right? You're not going to make it pretty. You're going to make it as ugly as it is. Right? I, you know, that's how I feel about things. You know, to be truthful with what you're seeing and representing. Um, I'm a Chicana, but I didn't wanna, you know, represent Chicanas in a way that I don't know them to be, you know? I want to represent Chicanas in all their glory of what they are, even if it's not pretty. And that is so valuable. That is the most valuable thing you can offer a viewer is the truth. You know, if you change the truth that she's like, I don't know, a bad cook, for example. <laughs> you know. Just do it, I think that that is what I love about documentary. Documentary is about truth and just try to adhere to that as much as possible. You know, I don't think I'm a Chicana, you know, I have to represent Chicanas as nice and good and virtuous. You know, I wanna show a Chicana the way she trashed me, you know? And that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have time for one more, and the, the woman I'm seeing raising her hand right here, yes. So what would you do differently if you could go back to day one? Let's address that question first. What would you do differently, if anything? I'm arrogant. <laughs> I, I, I think I did everything right. <laughs> and secondly, what advice would you give to filmmakers who are looking to follow a similar path? Just do everything right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really incredible speaking to you up here on stage, and I'm so glad that you're here all weekend. You're back tomorrow for your films Vida and La Ofrenda, and then we'll see you here on Sunday as well.
for The Devil Never Sleeps. So I hope to see some of you back here for those. Those are screening at 4 o'clock and 2 o'clock, respectively, on Saturday and Sunday. Again, tomorrow is open to anyone who comes to the museum. We're really opening the doors of the Ted Mann Theater to invite you all in to see these two extraordinary films together and to hear more from you. This is just a taste. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the weekend with you, and we're just so thrilled that you're here. Thank you so much for being Thank here, Lourdes. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, really. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. I am so proud of you. I'm so glad you made the drive.